Welcome to CAM Radio, an ahead of the curve initiative by Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas, bringing you every Friday the latest in legal and policy. Stay tuned, enjoy listening. Good morning, dear listeners. Today, I have the honor and privilege of interviewing Mr. Cyril Shroff. My name is Ram Gobind. And I'm a corporate M&A partner at Cyril Amachand Mangalas. I've been working with Mr. Shroff for the past 15 years, and I've mostly been responding to his impatient queries over time. Queries like, is this done? Or where are we at on that? So this for me is an interesting opportunity to ask him some questions of my own. I expect to speak to him for the next half hour or so on his journey as a professional, his aspirations as a mentor, coach, and leader, and how, and how he manages change, his work ethic, work-life balance, and even his views on the controversial 70-hour work week. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Dan. To start us off, this is our first edition of CAM Radio for 2024. What are your thoughts on the year gone by? Because it was a year of business opportunity and growth for sure, but also a year of global conflict. Thanks, Ram, and happy to uh, do this uh, inaugural episode for this year. Uh, we had a great uh, set of uh, podcasts last year, but uh, good to uh, open the innings for 2024. So the year 2023 that has gone by was an interesting one. Uh, it had uh, several facets to it. A couple of things that stood out for me was, uh, firstly, how the world was generally behaving and how India was different. I think the world uh, saw conflict, the world saw uh, economic stresses of various kinds, uh, and uh, obviously climate was a big issue as well. So it was generally a bit dark and gloomy in the world around. But as I look at India, I think it was a slightly different story. There was more optimism. Uh, I think we, you know, while it's always the economy is a kind of a relative thing, but we at least saw growth. Uh, and more importantly, we saw hope in the eyes of uh, Indian businesses and, uh, and, and policymakers. So I think that what really stood out for me was this dichotomy between the world uh, and India. Uh, the year gone by was not without its challenges. It was a tough year. Uh, but at the same time, I think there were uh, many upsides as well. It was also the year in which we officially became the most populous uh, country on the planet. Uh, and I think that for and by itself was a pivotal moment because it uh, it automatically threw up a lot of possibility and opportunity. So that's 2023 for me. Coming now to the new year, in this year you enter the, I mean, or you are well within the early 40s of your professional career. And as they say, you have more years in legal experience than many people have years at all. And that is certainly true in my case. So what do you hope for in this year? What are your aspirations? And what do you lose sleep over? So great uh, question, Ram. So typically the 40s, now here meaning 40s as a, just a period, not because I'm much older than 40. But the 40s are often a time of midlife crisis. Uh, but for me, um, I think the 40s in a professional experience context have brought a great sense of clarity and calm. Uh, it has pushed me to be a more uh, authentic version of myself personally and for the firm as well. Uh, because you, you know, when you have 40 years behind you at anything, you, uh, you are not that restless uh, uh, insecure individual. You kind of you have a little bit of that attitude of a bit of you know been there done that. But and that brings you uh, a sense of calm and also sharp focus. So uh, you know I think I continue to be even more ambitious. Uh, I think I uh, my my current approach is to look uh, creatively at the future. Uh, with two lenses. One is how do I preserve the core of what we are and at the same time actively disrupt uh, a number of uh, a number of things uh, because if I don't, I think the market will. Uh, and 
uh, you know just set ourselves up for uh, even more uh, even more success so you know a lot of things are going to change and uh, we uh, as the cliche goes that if you want to uh, you know face change you have to be the change yourself and that i think is what uh, we will uh, we will need to do we will need to constantly innovate um, i think this is a time of incredible opportunity for india and indians uh, as a general philosophy i mean even if you simply say that let me just do what is right for india and align ourselves completely with the india trajectory you can't go wrong uh you uh, you know the the days where uh people thought that in order to do well you have to kind of go and you know transport your uh you know skills and go into another country all that i think is totally over this is where it's all happening um, and i think this is an uh, incredible opportunity to embrace uh, embrace that i just wish i was 20 years younger i'm i'm fortunately there i am 20 years younger for a little more than that actually so uh, this is uh, you know the fact that we need to be the change agent is a you know, certainly a useful uh, piece of advice uh, you mentioned your professional journey and you know, as someone who reads autobiographies and biographies uh, what the question that you often ask is you know what are some of the highlights of your professional journey uh, that will be inspiring for you know younger lawyers such as, such as myself so when i look at my professional journey uh, it's actually has a number of strands to it uh, just the pure lawyer strand as well just the act part about you know delivering legal services to a client that's one part the second part i think is about building a firm and building an institution which requires a different set of skills and i think the third uh, is about the impact that you have in your industry and profession and all the three are kind of slightly different the highlights um, you know i have uh, over a period of 40 years in in the profession you get a chance to do many things so i have been a litigator i was very fortunate to have been at the right place at the right time when liberalization happened uh, in uh, 1991 92 and that period and uh, a lot of uh, first time matters kind of fell into my lap as it was the first uh, international listing of gdrs uh, several of the initial project fin limited uh, recourse project finance uh, you know, transactions like dabol and several others major litigations uh, large uh, mna as well and some of those transactions and matters were happening for the first time in india and having um, you know being on the pitch uh, at that time was invaluable and i think those the, the first time will never happen the first time can only happen once so i think that was probably a defining uh, phase in my lawyer career the uh, on the second strand uh, of what are some of the highlights i think i was fortunate uh, to have been uh, one of the primary change agents for what i would call inventing the modern legal industry i think the uh, the the indian legal profession always a very respected uh, profession there was a kind of a watershed moment uh, pre 1990 and and thereafter particularly in terms of how talent was sourced trained and groomed and scalable organizations were created uh, and i think I, i i personally feel that i played a, a very critical role in modernizing the uh you know indian legal profession and today it's a much larger profession but um i think i was probably the primary change agent uh when uh, when we started off and that disrupted the profession in a positive uh, kind of way so that would be one of my uh, definitely one of the highlights and uh, i i don't think it kind of stopped there because we always had that mindset of uh looking at um uh, you know new things out of curiosity and constantly sharpening and uh, uh, refining our, our business model and that exercise continues today as well so on the second hand of uh, you know building a modern law firm a it's a continuous exercise 
but B, I think uh, it is one of the defining contributions I think uh, I have made. And I, and I don't want to sound uh, self-congratulatory on this, but uh, as I look back, I think that's definitely something which goes into my memoirs whenever I write them. And I think the third part uh, really is the impact on the profession. It kind of flows from the second strand uh, of uh, you know the, the the law firm creation of a modern law firm uh, because by uh, you know both by uh, example uh, as well as you know even contributing uh, to a very large part of the alumni uh, of the profession, I think it has had a big a uh, big impact. Uh, I think we created, uh, we fundamentally moved away from jobs to creating legal careers uh, as, a, uh, as a as a kind of a long-term career. So I think that was probably uh, when I put on my retrospective lens, these would be the three things. Uh, and I'm not done yet. So I think, uh, uh, as they say, picture of the baki. All right. I think the... <laughs> Long-awaited memoir is something which a lot of uh, lawyers who owe their careers to you will certainly read. So it will be a bestseller right out of the box, I would think. Uh, on the sort of points that you mentioned and the you know three different strands of uh, a lawyer building uh, building the firm, building an institution, and you know also the contributions to uh, careers. Uh, Building an institution involves a significant, and that to such a large institution and such a wanted institution involves a great degree of leadership. So what does that leadership mean to you? And the second part of that question is, what do you expect from younger leaders who you've trained and groomed over the years? So, uh, yeah, so that's a two-part question, uh, which kind of flows from the question that I just answered in terms of institution building. So uh, for this, and you know, as I'm thinking through this, uh, you have to be able to, you know, get out of your body uh, and think through the institution as something different from from yourself. Uh, and you have to think about the institution in this case, can uh, as having some a separate persona, and you have to clinically ask your question, uh, ask the question about what are the uh, attributes and what are the values that this institution will lead for longevity. Uh, now, one of the big drivers uh, for me personally and, uh, you know, for the founder family, if I can call it that, but let me restrict it just now to myself, is longevity and legacy. We are completely driven by that. We take pride at the fact that, you know, we've been around for more than a century and uh, we are always thinking about how do we uh, live for and and thrive for another hundred. So uh, you know, legacy and longevity are two extremely powerful uh, motivators. So and, and along with that comes a certain value system. Uh, the value system of uh, always doing the right thing. Uh, of uh, not taking unnecessary uh, risks of a certain kind, but at the same time being sufficiently entrepreneurial to take entrepreneurial risks. So, you know, balancing the risk reward on different types of decisions, I think is, uh, is a very important part of it. So it's like in a game of cricket, you want to play for a long century or a double century. You know, you don't hit that, uh, you don't go after the, ball outside the off stump when which you may you may you may get caught so you have to avoid those but then the right ball comes you got to hit it out of the park uh, so it's uh, and it's getting that fine judgment about which risk to take and which not but always looking at it from the lens of longevity and legacy we are we are, we are not t20 players uh, in that sense we are fundamentally our mindset is of a test match so, uh, and I think this kind of drives the core, uh, core thinking. And from this flows uh, various streams of values uh, which you have to stay true to all the time. So, My takeaway from that, insofar as young leaders would be that, you know, have a long-term uh, approach and an institution-building approach. Yeah. Um, 
And yeah. so okay, I, I should have answered that for second part of the question on what is my advice to the, uh, for the uh, younger leaders. And I, I thank you for bringing that up. So uh, this is partly a kind of a generation thing as well. So, uh, and it's nothing confined only to the legal profession. I think it's probably the sign of our times uh, that people think of careers uh, in, you know, in terms of one or two years. But uh, the legal profession uh, is is like a like a dish that you have to marinate over a long period of time. So I've, I've often advised uh, folks, including you, that in the legal profession you have to think of your career in decades. You can't think of your career in in terms of uh, one or two years. You know, you get to be something uh, only after you have uh, at least a decade uh, behind you. So the uh, uh, my advice to younger lawyers uh, is to be less impatient. And I think spend enough time just developing yourself and having that long-term mindset. Now, it's easy for me to say that because I've already put four decades behind me. Uh, but I mean, I, I, I've seen this not only in my own case, but for many others. I mean, if you look at the tallest leaders uh, in the profession today, They've all put in the decades behind them. I, I don't know of any uh, any success any sto success story where people have managed to kind of pull a rabbit out of the hat in a in a couple of years. So definitely develop a long term mindset. The second part about uh, not just young lawyers but young leaders, I think they have to uh, think of life a little differently. I mean, if in their own way, they should think about uh, what their uh, legacy should be. What is their core uh, value system? And I'll come to that separately in my own case as well. Uh, you have to think about what is the impact that you want to have and what legacy you want to leave behind in whatever form. And everybody leaves a legacy in, in, uh, in some form uh, or the other. So it's about adding depth uh, and about uh, you know, being reflective and adding um, uh, adding substance to yourself because our profession is such our profession is about taking other people's problems and solving them our profession is about giving wise advice and you know you know in a recent post uh, i put out i made the distinction between kala vidya and buddhi uh, kala is a skill a technical skill which is very important and i think you need all three uh, sector like the uh, second is Vidya, which is knowledge. But the most important thing is uh, Buddhi, which is true wisdom. And people come to us, and particularly a firm like us, for the latter, where you actually look at the overall situation and are able to give wise, uh, deep advice, uh, not just in terms of you know being very skilled at turning out a, a document. Yeah, there is a place for that. But in my view, you know that that part is probably going to be in the medium term going to be replaced by technology. Uh, finally, what we will stand out is uh, is Buddhi. And, you know, sorry to go off on a little bit of a tangent, but the Bhagavad Gita talks of 20 types of Buddhi as well, and each has its own, but I'm just sort of generalizing it in one category of, uh, uh, of Buddhi. So, advice to young leaders uh, is uh, develop depth and a strong value system. All right, sir. Tom, the uh, points you made about you know the need for decadal levels of experience in order to become eventually a tall leader. During your decades of experience, who were your mentors who you looked up to both as a leader as well as a lawyer and from whom you've today drawn the value system that you wish to embed in the organization and which you hope the young leaders will embed in the ones that come after them? Great question, Ram. And I think it kind of falls in, for me, it falls in three buckets. Uh, I think the overwhelming influence uh, in my case was my father. He, he passed away at a relatively young age, but he left a very deep uh, impression on me. I think my professional identity and particularly the, the lawyer bit, I would say I'm substantially modeled uh, on him. Reasons being, firstly, he was incredibly hardworking kind of embodied character, competence, and commitment in you know, one person. Uh, and uh, he was obsessed about his, uh, his work, but he never got tired. 
uh, he could keep working uh, tirelessly. So I think in a in a universe of uh, hundred, I think fifty marks go to go to him. And then, uh, uh, as far as the rest is concerned, it is actually made up of many individuals uh, for different points uh, because you learn something from everybody. And I have a little bit of the uh, you know, Eklavia syndrome as well, where you, your, your mentor or your guru need not be somebody you're directly learning from. You can watch from a distance and also learn uh, from people just by observing closely and following uh, their story. So I have learned from captains of industry, for example, uh, Dhirubhai, uh, or uh, even more recently, uh, Gautam Bhai as well. Or you learn every day from your prime minister who works uh, incredibly hard. So what have these people taught me? I think they've taught me uh, be bold, think big, uh, scale is important, be resilient. Um, you know, these people are made of very different stuff and um, you have to take probably the best, uh, best of each one of them and put it uh, and, you know, take that one quality and bring it in yourself. So any human being, whether me or you, we are all comprised of little, little bits of things that we have learned from many people. So that is the second category. Um, the third category, I've been fortunate, I think, to have met various very senior global lawyers, uh, managing partners of firms, uh, you know, chairmen and all of them as well. Uh, one of them who's kind of stand out for me is uh, Marty Lipton. Uh, who, who was probably in his uh, in his 90s and still comes to work uh, as well. I mean, after having been there, done that and everything as well, he just keeps going. So if there's one thing which I've learned from him, both uh, remotely as well as through conversations with him, is just keep, keep at it, keep going. And the fourth, completely different from all of this, not in the world of business, is uh, from, from art and artists. Uh, you um, you know, one thing which art or architecture teaches you that the only thing that survives you is your work. A person may come and go hundreds of years may pass, but your work uh, remains. Um, and some of the uh, most defining uh, you know, contributions to, uh, to our world uh, is the great pieces of art that have been produced. And, and many of them work through their 70s, 80s, 90s, and continue to work till the last day. These are uh, uh, these are values that, uh, and that's why I mean, their names are remembered even hundreds of years uh, later. So all of these things collectively put together have contributed in their own large or small way to civil shop. And I'm still learning, uh, so I'm not done yet. I think uh, most leaders are lifelong learners and I think that's a takeaway and you take it from different pieces and that's what sort of forms the eventual mosaic of a personality. Yes, mosaic and is right. So I think throughout uh, a lot of what you've said now, one of the words that sticks out is one of values and, you know, inherently interlinked with culture. Now, having worked here, having worked with you for so many years, Culture is something that you you feel every day. It's not something that's codified. So what to you represents the Amachand culture? And how do you pass that on as a part of the organization's DNA? Because an organization or a firm is inherently individual. And it's just you know passed on through these interactions. So how do you how do you do that? And how do you do that through well over a such a long period of time? So I'll answer the how and the what question separately. So firstly, in terms of what? So, uh, and, and you know, culture is such a uh, broad and subjective term that you could define it uh, in whichever way. But as I think about your question, I can think about four or five things which are very important to me. And I try every day to empower, uh, you know, to think about them and to invite them. And I think about them uh, as my quote-unquote superpowers. Uh, so the first one I would really single out uh, and from which some of the other strands flow is humility. I think it's very important. Uh, it's, uh, it makes you curious. It actually is one of the greatest risk management devices because if you're humble, you will listen and you know you won't make a mistake 
uh, by having hubris. So that's number one. Number two, I think, is uh, authenticity. You know, nothing puts me off more than fakes and imposters. Uh, um, we, uh, I'm naturally attracted towards authentic people, and I try to be as authentic as uh, uh, myself in any interaction. The third, and I think this kind of flows from my dad, is just hard work. You know, I've never had a problem in just, you know, working myself uh, to the bone because I never consider work as work and I think you guys have seen it. Uh, so I think hard work is absolutely critical and nothing of any substance is ever achieved without just putting in the time and effort. Integrity, I think in particular in a profession like ours, uh, you have to be, and integrity, not just financial integrity, I think it is about your belief system. I think, you know, both from my father's time and myself even today I think the Amarchan lawyer and I you know a lot of lawyers in the firm uh, embody it is uh, we will break but not bend when it comes to a ethical decision so and I, with that uh, 100% you know um, 24 karat gold on integrity I think is very important nobody will think of a cam lawyer as somebody who does not have integrity and this is very important for for passing down. And a couple of, I'll just add a few bonus points to the mix. I think it is curiosity. I, I think it's not a personal value of mine, but I think I can see some of that flowing into, I think you have it, uh, Ram and Spades. In, I think you have to be constantly curious about uh, about new things, about new ideas, uh, and across, uh, not just in the law, but about so many different things, about you got to be curious about what's happening in in AI, you've got to be curious what's happening in Bollywood. You've got to be curious about what is happening in politics, uh, in, 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 in everything. I think um, you just got to have that. You have to have that humility to understand first that you know very little uh, compared to the total uh, pool of knowledge that is available and have a hungry mindset. So I think this would be the four or five things. Uh, I mean, obviously, you can make a, as long a list as possible, but if you were to ask me, just pick your five, best five. These would be my best five. Uh, and if I'd like, you know, if a random person in the market should be a cam lawyer, I want immediately people to associate them with these values. So this guy is humble, this guy is authentic, this guy is hardworking, impeccable integrity, and is a curious fellow. If, if he can achieve this for all our thousand lawyers, we are hope. Since you mentioned 3,000 lawyers and... and... Uh, we look for these qualities in them, but every lawyer also comes with their personal and professional aspirations and they look to you to sort of uh, uh, fulfill these aspirations. So how do you manage these multifarious aspirations? And is that a weight on your shoulders? And if so, how do you wear it? No, absolutely. So, you know, uh, one of my big designations apart from managing partner, is a uh, career custodian. Uh, I'm actually a, more of a career custodian for all the people who work in the firm. Uh, um, and it's a tough one because, uh, and tough one for various reasons. Firstly, uh, people have different levels of both ability and aspiration. Secondly, they're dealing in a time where there are so many multiple generations working together. I recently called the firm uh, like a cake with multiple uh, layers of, uh, of chocolate and you can't deal with only one layer of the cake, you have to deal with all the layers at the same time. You have to deal with a 40-year-old, a 50-year-old and a 25-year-old and a 30-year-old all at the same time. And you have to make sure that you're catering to uh, their different and they're very nuanced. You know, actually, I think as you know, uh, something changes every two or three years in everything. Even if you see it coming out of law college, uh, every two or three years, there are subtle differences in terms of uh, the, the, the folks who come out. So, you're actually, in a way, dealing with, I would say, in the firm today, anywhere between 15 to 20 different uh, layers of the cake. So, that is the complexity level. How do I deal with it? Um, I wish I knew the honest answer, but I just use a simple hack on this, which is I listen. Uh, as you know, every year I do a, a, a listening down hall. And uh, I try to so do these two things. One is I, I kind of listen with an open mind and not just hear, I listen. Um, and uh, I am a great believer in uh, reverse mentoring. You know, today my 
uh, I have a large pool of reverse mentors who uh, come and talk to me, and uh, I'm not judgmental. In fact, I uh, some of my best ideas come from uh, my reverse uh, reverse mentor. So if I think you just maintain, uh, I mean, a simple hack for this: listen, uh, keep an open mind. Don't bring your ego to the conversation, uh, and and don't just talk to people who are in the senior echelons. Because at some point of time they start giving you stale advice. If you want fresh advice, talk to the younger younger generations. Talk to your twenty five. And I spend a lot of time with of your twenty five year old and your twenty seven year old. And firstly, it's very contrasting. And unless as a leader of a human service and a professional services organization where your assets kind of walk up and down the lift every day, unless you're listening to them, uh, you will kind of miss the bus. So that I think is a simple hack, but I have no magic bullet. It's a tough one. It's listening for me is a sort of great takeaway because uh, there's an interesting book uh, called The Charisma Myth by Olivia Fox Cabin, where she talks about active listening. as one of the key characteristics of a leader uh, and the ability to have that open mind and be receptive to ideas and impressions across the board and across the organization and when you're dealing with so many layers i think that becomes becomes sort of all the more all the more critical i'll just move to a, another facet of leadership one is of course what you just indicated of dealing with you know multiple generations in the firm as a layer cake uh but how do you deal with change in the world i mean you were you started practice in 82 pre liberalization pivoted in liberalization and uh as the laws have kept evolving you've moved from litigation to other spheres uh to a, being a leader in the in project finance in corporate laws in listings so one is the legal as the legal world is changing and the other is as the world itself is changing with the advent of things like ai how do you change how do you manage such change how do you keep yourself and your organization relevant so uh, the organization i think is a, is a particularly large organization i think the the playbook is a little different but personally how i have uh, managed i think it has arisen out of two things uh, one is my inherent curiosity even as i go back to the early stages of my legal career uh, i was always very curious even when i was a litigator i wanted to know what is happening in corporate law uh, i wanted to know what is happening in the capital markets and i think liberalization you know opened up so many possibilities as well so uh, the combination of curiosity and humility uh, brings you makes you a very restless person uh, and i think when you are that kind of professionally restless and curious you uh, you have the ability to learn new things um the uh, uh, and maybe it's kind of you know i have been fortunate that i got the opportunities to learn them uh, nobody was judging me in terms of okay you know this is a uh, just trying his hand at something things turned out well so luck has a big part to play in this as well very big part to play because you know sometimes you just have to be at the right place and have the right opportunity you know some important matter may just come to you uh, from nowhere and that you may learn so much in that one matter that you may not learn in 20 small uh, uh, matters uh, or you know situation that well so combination of curiosity humility and just plain luck i think this is kind of uh, in for i'm speaking for myself as an organization uh, how do you kind of constantly keep it uh, keep it in a kind of a learning mode one is to learn on all of the above and at this point in today's camp i think there are a number of uh, partners uh, who have a similar mindset who want to learn uh, you know new things as well i think some of this has rubbed off on many of them so i have a i think i know one of them as well of uh, you know having that uh, inherent curiosity of learning new things so if i can bring in another vocabulary that we have been using in the firm of balance sheet so you know there like in the accounting world there is pnl and there is pnl is your sort of annual revenue and how you are doing commercial but in the, in this firm we focus a lot on building uh, building balance sheet and this is personal balance sheet as well the, 
the long term skills uh, that we develop uh, so once you focus on them i don't think you'll have a problem in learning uh, learning new things and just learning different versions of the same thing also corporate law changes every day we got to stay updated on learning humility curiosity and adaptation uh and i take away from this uh i'll move now to a controversial question because in preparing that personal balance sheet uh the cost is time and there is there is uh you know the recently uh, the controversial issue on social media where <clears throat> older leaders have been either applauded or excoriated for supporting the 70 hour work week now where do you come out on this debate in so far as lawyers are concerned now but before you respond i just want to provide a branch of support so there is this uh, interesting book by malcolm gladwell uh, called the outlier where he talks about the 10000 hour rule now he says the reason that the top sports persons doctors musicians and he you know has a long winded description about the beatles were or are at the very top of their game is because of unrelenting practice and in his estimation it takes 10000 hours of practice to get there so when you look at that as a principle and the time that it takes over decades to arrive at the top of your profession uh, what are your thoughts on this on this debate so i am in the 70 hour camp but i am also uh, very mindful of uh, the controversy and i don't want to sort of impose that view on anybody else so the way i look at it is a slightly different lens i i you use the word the cost that you have to pay but at the after paying the cost and the price for it what is what is it that that the end of it so i think you have to first ask your question ask yourself the question or oh, what is my goal aspiration what do i want to achieve i can put forth the uh, the 70 hour work rule for myself because i continue to be extremely ambitious i still have a lot to achieve and therefore i need to spend this time to it's it's a it's a mathematical thing if i need to get to a, if i need to reach the mountain top of whatever it is or if i need to achieve a certain goal for the firm then 70 hours is the price i should be willing to pay if i decide to set my ambitions for myself or for the firm at a lower level i can do it in 30 hours Uh, why do i need to so it's a i think it's simply a mathematical equation of uh, the goal you said and it is in your power to set that goal for yourself so in in uh, when big things have been done whether it's building large com- iconic companies or you know you mentioned the example of people who have uh, whether it's the beatles or or artists who achieve they set themselves first a goal that i want to reach this particular height then you just take the uh, uh, the cost and divide it by the number of hours it's, it's mathematical actually i see it as a mathematical thing of um, what is it that i need to contribute to my effort and divide it by the number of hours that is available other than you know waking sleep you know sleeping and eating and all of that and you get 70 and i realized that you know till recently i was doing close to plus minus 60 anyway another 10 is okay and i mean it doesn't mean that i'm going to do 70 till uh, forever i need to do it now for what i have currently set uh, as my uh, short to medium term goals because I, i won't get there otherwise so either i compromise on the hour i compromise on the goal i don't want to compromise on the goals so then 70 is a mathematical uh, result i was hoping to catch you up on this so you are not expecting i will slip up on this query but this was this was a wonderful answer and very true <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you 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 sidestepped that and punched it out punched it out of the park uh i'll just move now uh, so sort of from uh, from uh, professionals uh, to sort of india so where do you see the growth of india in the next few years and its growth trajectory and what is the role that you think professions will play in this journey as far as nation building is concerned absolutely i think um, you know this is something which you know in every function of the firm that we do we start with the national anthem so you cut my veins you'll find uh, you know india flowing out of it so i have been a, a incorrigible uh, optimist for india um, and even in our darkest moments i've never lost faith in, in india now it seems to be all kind of uh, coming together finally for for india i think not only indians but even the world has 
bought into the India uh, story. Even some of the international press, which is otherwise critical of us, at least will grudgingly admit that this is a, a super economic superpower the, in the in the making. So that's I think thesis number one. So if India is uh, on its way to becoming uh, a top three global economy and is going to generate so much uh, of, of GDP, if nothing else, but just simple compounding, uh, then clearly the, the you know you have to see this with a growth mindset that uh, from an opportunity point of view, it's not going to be missing um, or it's going to be falling short. So you it's one of the it's like an ocean you can. What is your capacity to drink the water? Uh, so whether it's going to be healthcare, infrastructure, uh, you know, technology. I, I actually think some of the greatest technology investments, are, yeah, innovations are going to come out of India. I can see whether in healthcare or technology, the next few trillion dollar companies will, will be created from, uh, from or by Indians from India as well. So this is how I see it. Uh, maybe it's my rose-colored uh, lenses about India, but even if we don't achieve the goal by 2047, and it takes a little longer. The direction of travel is, I think, very clear. Uh, what should a, therefore, uh, a, a young uh, lawyer think about it? He should think about it with a sense of abundance and with a sense of, in a way, a sense of impatience as well. The things are actually going to move very fast. Are you ready to run at that pace? This is going to require a lot of fast running. And equally on the, on the sidelines of that is technology. <clears throat> you know, our biggest competitor is not going to be uh, people. It's going to be AI-enabled clients. Because the AI is inv being invented for everybody, not just for professional service firms. Your AI-enabled client is going to be our biggest competitor. And we will need to, what we will have to bring to the table is Buddhi which cannot be replicated. To close, and I think uh, there is you know, overarching levels of change, a 40-year career. Um, what do you want your legacy to be? In terms of you know, what, what is it that you, you want to be most remembered for? And you mentioned earlier in this conversation about you know, individuals are remembered for the work and what they leave behind. So as a leader, as a lawyer, to the careers that you've influenced, the people that you've helped, what would you like your legacy to be? It's always a tricky one for anybody to sort of think out. But I think my legacy will be defined by the firm. You know, nobody remembers which matters you did or which cases you won. That that's a series of small small incidents which con which contribute to your kind of professional persona. But nobody individually remembers. Uh, in most cases, you know, the pieces of separate work that you did. Except that, yeah, you are a competent professional. So I think that's, uh, let's put that to the side. I obviously would like to be remembered for the, my professional reputation. But if there was one thing that I want to be remembered for is the um, firm that I leave behind for the institution. I think it's about the institution. Because how CAM fares in the future, uh, you know, in a, from a long-term perspective, uh, is what I will be. Uh, you think of anybody, you know, whenever you think of anybody's legacy, you remember when you look, when you put on a historic lens and you know, let history start judging you, it's always about the institution and the body of work uh, that you leave behind. So I think it has to be done. It has to be done. So, and, and the sad part about it is that some of that part of that legacy doesn't depend on you, it depends on, it depends on the, uh, of other people as well. So you just have to make sure that you work with the right people who are good custodians of the legacy. In a way, this connects this connects a lot of the lot of the stands, the the abundance, the impatience, being part of the India growth story, being part of the institution and leadership and passing it on. This has been a extremely uh, engaging and interesting conversation, personally as well. So thank you for this. Thank and you. Uh, Ram, thank thanks you. for the great questions. You you actually made me really think about uh, many things. Nice. And it's a constant process. So I think this dialogue is to be continued.